ahead and hit record. Uh, well, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our May Small Business Seminar on Navigating Growth in Challenging Times. Um, we're pleased to have Doug Howard here. He's the president and founder of Growth Team Strategies and is a leading authority on small business strategy, specializing in business growth, improving processes, increasing profitability and succession planning. For more than 30 years, Doug has worked with hundreds of small business owners across the US and Canada to help them overcome challenges and develop strategies for achieving their dreams. He does this through training, webinars, writing, facilitated meetings, and one-on-one -on -one consulting. He's known for his entertaining yet informative approach to business ideas and strategy, and he likes to bring uh, complex business concepts into clarity with real life stories and recognizable examples. And he is a graduate of the Wharton School of Business. Um, we are going to let him take the floor. We should have some time at the end for questions. Um, so if you have a question and it's a burning question, you can type it in the chat. We'll be monitoring that. Um, or we can um, save them till the end of the program. All right. The floor is yours. Thank well, you, Doug. Kim, thank you so much. Uh, welcome to the folks that are here in the room with us and welcome to the folks that are online. This is this is cool. Kim, are they going to be able to ask questions? Or are we going to hold questions for the end? Is that how um, we're going to do it? Yeah, we'll yeah. be monitoring the chat. So okay. if someone pops a yeah. question up, we so, will. So this is designed to be relatively interactive. Um, I will tell you after that introduction, I had a girlfriend once that told me that I was a great boyfriend on paper. <laughs> so I hope the consulting experience goes better than that, right? <laughs> so anyhow. Um, yeah, so my name is Doug Howard. I'm president of Growth Team Strategies. There's a little bit about what we do. I put that up there for one purpose, to let you know the things I'm going to talk about are not just things that we've kind of thought of or dreamt of or whatever. These are things that we have put in place and partnered with companies across the U.S., mostly service businesses, some other kinds of companies, but really on how to navigate growth. So the early part of my career, I spent about 20 years in the accounting business, owned an accounting company. I was not a CPA. Um, love the accounting world and I love understanding the numbers and how they can come to tell a story about a business and kind of point us in the right direction. Um, but what we also realized and we looked at that accounting practice and we were in four states, had about a thousand clients, was one of the biggest challenges was how to grow a business, right? A lot of information out there about how to start a business, a lot of information about what to do when things are going off the rails, even a little bit about succession. But growing a business is kind of hard because if there's not necessarily something wrong, it's hard, sometimes hard to know what the next step is to take. And yet growing these businesses is really um, important. So we spent a lot of our time focusing on that. So one of the questions we like to always ask folks when we very first start talking to them is where will, you, where will your business be in five years? And what is your next step? So the one thing I would ask you as we're thinking about things today is not just to think about today or this week or what we have to get done by the end of the month or even what you're going to do in 2024. But I'd like you to think about where you'll be from a business standpoint, from a personal standpoint, five years from today. All right, so it's May 15th, 2029. How old are you? Where do you live? Is it still in the same house, right? What's the next vacation? You know, Jules will be fondly remembering five years ago having been to the Netherlands, right? And so put yourself in that moment and say, okay, what do I want true for me and my life and how I'm living and how I'm spending my time? And then what needs to be true of the business for that to be able to happen? Does that make sense? Because the business should be a vehicle to the things that we want to do personally. It took me a long time to understand that. So, you know, growing any business is a huge challenge. You know, we have to have the right strategic plan. We have to have the right balance of time, people, and money. And I will uh, say, uh, you guys are already taking notes, which is great. I am more than happy, and I'll show you at the end how to get the slides. We want to share all of that. So don't feel like you have to write it all down or take pictures. You're more than welcome to. But don't, uh, I have to take notes because I don't remember stuff if I don't, but just want to make sure we'll make all this stuff available to you. Um, so yeah, the right strategic plan, the right balance of time, how you're spending your time, but also the balance of how you're utilizing people and money. Um, being the GPS, I think it's really important. One of the concepts that we really like to um, get people to understand, especially if they're not numbers folks, is it's important to kind of know where you stand and where the plan is and how a business emulates a GPS, right? We have a, we have a plan, we have a route. Uh, we know where we are at any time if we're looking at our accounting. 
And the business owner's job is to make sure that when things are off route, we respond to that. We recalculate, we figure out where we need to be. And then just planning for the future and not just putting out fires today. A lot of times when I work with business owners, I see, you know, the vast majority of the time when they look at how they're mapping their week out or their calendars or things like that are things that are here and now. And that's fine. But a very small percentage of time is spent on things that people will tell me are super important for their, where they want their business to be, but they're the easiest things to put off. Developing people, getting certain certifications, how you're expanding your market presence. So we know that really in any situation, growing a business is, is tough. And that's why a lot of companies you know, get to a certain point and then it's hard to get beyond that point. Um, right now though, I would say that we are in somewhat turbulent times, right? Not, not necessarily bad times. It's not the crisis that I think some people predicted. Um, I don't think it's the surge that we saw a little bit after COVID, after all the confusion we saw with COVID, right? Some industries went way high, some industries went way low. But the fact is, it's a, it's a period of time where I would say there's turbulence. And to me, I do a lot of flying. You know, turbulence is not a reason not to fly, but it's something a good pilot has to know how to navigate. Right? They need to know how to anticipate it. They need to know what it looks like. They need to not, they need to react, but not overreact, right? But it's certainly nice when you're flying and someone says, put your seatbelt on because we're about to experience turbulence, as opposed to, sorry about that. I didn't know we were gonna experience turbulence, right? So when we look at the economy, sometimes leads are slowing down. There's the uncertainty of what does it mean that interest rates are going up? What does it mean that we're in an election year? Uh, sort of. It's kind of a weird election, too, where it's happening and not happening. But I guess in Maryland, it happened as much as it was going to yesterday, yeah. right? At least for now. Um, but the whole idea of what do I do with this business and how do I read the signs of what's going on become even more challenging, you know, during this period of time. So it makes it more challenging to grow a business. So I just want to share with you 10 strategies um, that we see that have been really helpful with folks a little bit about each one, what we think it means. There's different ways to implement them. Um, and certainly happy to discuss any of them. So for each strategy, we're gonna kind of give you the strategy. I'm gonna give you kind of an action word in, in red, a little bit of a description, and then in blue, sort of what we're, our recommendation is, okay? Um, so strategy number one is to know where you stand, to really find, and the action word is to find out. What we are seeing right now is the story is not the same for different industries. The story is not the same for different geographies. Even within the state of Maryland, there are things happening in certain areas that aren't happening in other areas. So this is a really good time, even if you've been in business a long time, to take a step back and say, what's going on in my industry? What's going on in my area? What is my strategic position in the industry? And what is my financial position? Right, and getting really clear. So there's lots of good resources for that, right? One is the chamber, right? You guys put out lots of good information. There's a lot of good economic information. State of Maryland puts out information. There's also industry associations that people probably belong to that will kind of give you ideas about trends. The one thing I would say is this is the wrong time to look at a national trend or an industry-wide comment and react to that without drilling down to but what does that mean in my industry? What does that mean in my area? And where are we positioned? Are we strong? Are we strong, but we need better people? Financially, is it gonna be a little bit more of a challenge because we're coming off a slow period or we're financially in a good place? But really getting clarity on those things um, is important. Does that, does that make sense? And I think more than any time I've seen in the 30 years I've been doing this, like in 2008, when the recession happened, everybody knew where things were pointed. They were pointed down. Right. Um, even even during COVID, with some of the craziness that went on, once someone said whether we were essential or not, your cast was died for already for you. Now I think we got to really think that through. So the strategy recommendation is to write a plan for the rest of 2024 and 2025 that basically answers those questions. And it doesn't have to be super detailed or super crazy, but just take a little time, do that research. It could be a one or two page document, but it says for me for my team, for my outside advisors, like my accountant, my attorney, my banker, whoever I rely on, this is where I think we are and this is what we're seeing, right? Because that's the best way I think to help us put together a good growth strategy. All right, strategy number two is to really clarify your particular strategy, particularly as it relates to your customers. 
And so for this, uh, the action word that I have here is choose, right? A little bit after COVID, what we saw was a lot of businesses getting into a wider array of things than they ever got into before. Sometimes out of necessity, right? Sometimes they needed to take on a new product line or find a new revenue source. But I have remodeling companies that started doing decks. I have restaurants that started doing catering. And some of that was just essential. Some of it was necessary. Some of it was that there was just a glut of activity in certain areas where people were just willing to buy stuff. And so it was hard to turn them away. Now what we're finding though, is for folks to be as effective as they could be at growing, at staffing, at pricing, at setting themselves apart in the market, it's really important that the customer can tell what you're good at, why they should be spending money with you, what the specific things are that you can do that maybe other folks don't do quite as well. And so we wanna kind of get people thinking about the fact that I see this a lot on websites. And I know it's hard because some of this runs counter to SEO, right? SEO, they said like, put every word in the English language on your website and people will find you, right? The problem is when they find you, they may not understand what it is you do or who you do it for, right? And we're going through some of that identity crisis in our own world. So we don't wanna be all things to all people. We wanna be where we are most competitive, right? And so I like to use the example or the phrase a lot, I use this a lot, that I always wanna be a big fish in a small pond, right? I like to work in certain industries. I like to work with certain chambers, but I would rather have a much bigger presence. Kim and I were talking about that this morning, right? In a couple of chambers that are really effective than be a member of 37 chambers and have the same level of anonymity across really all of them, right? But that's true also of the jobs that you do, the market area you serve, right? And so I have an example. This is from a company in Annapolis I tell his story because he allows me to. Um, we do a lot of work in the construction remodeling industry. And so there's a company called Creative Spaces Remodeling here in Annapolis. And they were going through some challenging times about five years ago when we started working with them. And they kind of lost focus. They had some projects that didn't go the way they wanted to. They had an estimator that was underpricing jobs. It was just a tough time. So we sat down and we looked at it and said, okay, what are you the very best at? What really excites you? What are the things that when you have that project, you knock it out of the park, right? And uh, John Johnson, the owner of the company, matter of fact, I had a call with him this morning on the way here, so he's front of mind. And he's still in business after five years, so that's awesome, right? But he said, you know what I love, Doug? I love waterfront projects. We do a really great job of understanding what you can and can't do around the Chesapeake Bay. We create awesome viewscapes. We're great at pop the top projects where we can take a single floor house and make it into a, you know, put a second story on it. And you have an even better view of the, of the uh, water and all that. So we were brainstorming ideas and I said, well, okay, I think what we need to do is have you exhi exhibit at the Annapolis Boat Show. And he said, well, you mean the home show? Right, we go to the home show. And I'm like, no, no, no. The home show is where your competitors are. The boat show is where your customers are, right? Because not everybody at the boat show is his customer, but I would argue every one of his customers are probably at the boat show, right? If you have money and you like fine things and you like the water and you on the waterfront and they put the second largest on water boat show in your backyard, you go, right? Now, guess how many remodeling companies exhibited at the boat show at that time? None. Right. And so he goes the first year and he gets a couple of leads and actually gets about four hundred thousand dollars worth of projects out of the boat show. That did cost him three thousand dollars to be there. He bought some shirts, had a few things. Probably should have bought some shirts from you guys. Right. But uh, we'll fix that for the next time. So the fact <laughs> is, now. Yeah, you got phone. OK, so the next year he goes, we do a little bit better. Still no other competition there in his industry. Right. And he picks up almost a million dollars worth of work. The next year was COVID, so they didn't have the boat show. Another year passes. Last year, and his company will do north of about five and a half to six million dollars this year. Three quarters of his work comes from the boat show. He's got the lowest marketing budget of anybody that I work with relative to his industry, and yet gets phenomenal returns. Why? Because he is literally a big fish in a small pond, right? And so one of the things that we've worked with clients on a lot is finding your boat show. Who's the industry? Who's the area? What's the thing that you can do the best for somebody that really sets you apart? When I pick up a client that's in like Auburn, California, right? Outside of San Francisco that I would never, ever, ever meet in any course of travels that I have. 
it's because one of the areas of focus we have is the remodeling industry. We're part of an organization that features that. They do a lot of training. We do a lot of education. That person finds us, and all of a sudden they know we're well-equipped to serve their needs, right? So within that industry, we're a big fish in a small pond. But that can be geographic. But a lot of people spread things too broadly, and their message is too broad. So we just want to make sure that we're choosing what we want. And I will tell you, you can define it pretty tight, pretty small, and there's still plenty of work, plenty of opportunity, right? But it just makes your story that much more uh, compelling. Okay, number three is to grow customer loyalty, to connect. Now, this is obvious, right? We all love our customers. We all know referrals is the best way to grow a business. But I will tell you, for the folks that tell me that, they don't really necessarily have a structured way of getting referrals, of staying in contact with their customers. Some will do a newsletter periodically or things like that, but it's pretty passive stuff. So one of the things we want to do is make sure we're driving repeat and referral business with a very focused message. What is it that you do? What can you do for somebody that's going to really make a difference? And then we really want to segment customers. It's okay to say, and it's hard because like for most of us, we're all looking for work, we're looking for business. And sometimes this is the hardest thing to say. And I heard this early on in my career and I thought it was the dumbest advice I ever heard. And I wish I had adhered to it earlier. Knowing when someone is not your customer and moving away from that in a nice way is really important about in, in ending up with the customers that you most want, right? But it's hard for us to do, to say, well, that's really not where we do our best work or there's somebody else out there better suited to do the work that we do. Um, there's a really good book, it's called The Referral Engine uh, by a gentleman by the name of John Jantz, J-A-N-T-S-C-H. He's written a couple of other books and it's all about how do you create a process, a structured process for getting referrals, for connecting with your customers. You know, and even the referrals you get, whether it's Google reviews or things you put on your website, a lot of times they're very general, right? So if someone says like, you know, I love Jules. He's the smartest guy I ever met, and I'd let him do anything financially for me. Like, that's nice, but it doesn't help the next person understand why they might want to really work with you. You know, so when someone talks about communication or innovative strategies or ability to use technology, the more specific that referral is, the more it helps you tell a story that, let's face it, if we're in a service business, what's the most challenging part about marketing a service business, do you think? What do you guys think? Those that are here in the room, what do you think? Yeah. You go out, you go to these networking events, you talk to somebody, I'm in the financial industry, I do consulting, I help people grow, I do their accounting. What's the most challenging thing, do you think? Making yourself stand out. Making yourself stand out, right? Because the things in a service business, exactly, right, is those things are easy to say, hard to do, and even harder to prove if someone doesn't know you, right? I, have, I love when construction people may say to me, like, the reason you choose us is because of our quality and our communication and we love our customers. Great. Show me a website where someone says like, we have a really competitive price, but we don't care that much about quality and our customers are there, but they're really not that important to us, right? <laughs> Your competitor is saying the same thing, whether it's true or not, right? And we all know in any industry, marketing, finance, technology, accounting, whatever it is, right? There are different levels. And Part of what frustrates us is we say to like, oh, well, that customer just made that decision on price, right? And sometimes we don't realize we have not given them a clear choice as to what the actual differences are. Yeah. I went out to buy a mattress about six months ago, right? I hadn't bought a mattress in a long time, quite clearly. So we go into the store and my wife always has a, like done tons of research. She always knows exactly what she wants. I never do any research. I have no idea what I want. Right. But I also like to make quick decisions. Like I'll buy a car in like 17 minutes. I actually proposed in about four days. I figured, you know, while, while I had her on the hook, I might as well close that deal. But the bottom line is, right, we go out and the guy says to me, what's your budget? Well, I don't know. What's my, I don't know, two, three hundred dollars. And he's like, so you don't want to be able to walk correctly when you're a senior citizen. And I'm like, the hell does that mean? Like, what are you talking about? And he's like, no, no. I mean, a good mattress. And he starts talking about coils and this and that. And I'm like, uh, okay, okay. You know, and you start to learn like what the process is. And eventually I walked out of there with this crazy expensive sleep number bed that I don't even like because every morning it tells me I didn't sleep correctly. So I don't need that negative reinforcement. <laughs> but the fact is, right, 
like when you have that level of knowledge and people are trying to make a choice, they don't even know what the choices are. They don't know the difference between a good accountant and a not good accountant, unless they've had a really bad experience, right? But then sometimes we hear ourselves saying like, well, we're not, we're not someone that'll leave you behind, or we're not somebody that'll mess this up. And it's like, but not messing things up is not something that excites people to spend money with you, right? And I always tell people, people will be like, oh, well, you know, we're up here, we're not Walmart. And it's like, yeah, but they're not comparing you to Walmart because you're priced up here. Right? So Neiman Marcus may be competing with Nordstrom's. Saying you're not Walmart is obvious, but it doesn't help you make a purchase. Right? So we got to give people clues about what the difference is. That is a lot easier to do if we focus on a particular area, a particular area of expertise. All right, number four, and this one has been really interesting over the last year. This is to turbocharge sales. Anybody that's in a sales role, I would say it's really, really important. And I, I'm, I'm guilty of this, right? I sell a lot. And I just started bringing some people into my company to grow the company. And now I have to show them how to sell what I sell. And I'm like, it's like watching my mother make Italian food, right? She doesn't have any recipes. She does a little of this, a little of this. Little. And it's like, okay, when mom goes, when mom passes, we are never having those meatballs again because no one can capture like what she does, right? So what we want to be able to do is take our sales process and say, well, first of all, let's document. Like, what is it? Like we have a conversation and we talk about this and we ask these questions and we go through this process. I will tell you, and you've probably heard this a thousand times, salespeople do way too much talking and spend a little time asking questions. The interesting thing is if someone buys from you right away, like that's not a problem. But if someone doesn't and you haven't asked a lot of questions, all of a sudden you get stalled in the process and you don't have a lot to talk about. Right. So when I can say, well, you know, Jules, I know you told me this is where you want to take your company and these are some things you're good at and these are some things you're struggling with. We are still having a good conversation that might get us to the point of working together. But if I don't know, if I haven't asked those questions, if I'm like, hey, this is what I do. This is why you should love it. And do you love it? And do you want it? And you go, yes or no. Yes is great. If you say no, there's nowhere for the conversation to go. Right. So we want to be asking those questions. I also think it is super important to get sales training. Most people that are in sales roles didn't necessarily intend to be in sales roles. And a lot of times people will say like, you know, I do sales for my company, but I'm not a salesman. Like, I don't want to be a sales. And it's like, okay, it doesn't mean you have plaid pants and white shoes, right? We, like, you know, you don't have to be, uh, I think it was Herb Tarlick from WKRP, for those of you that remember that television show, right? The, the kind of used car salesman salesman, but you are selling. So we want to get good at it. The one thing that we've seen, or one of the byproducts of COVID, is there was such a glut of activity happening that some companies, some businesses had plenty of business without having to really be good at sales or even connecting with their prospects. So we are finding now that as the water level recedes, right, we got a lot of folks out there that really need to sharpen their skills, really need to go back to asking those questions, understanding the pains of the customer, those kinds of things. And one of the things that we like to see people do is create a sales cookbook. And so by that, what we mean is not one of the outcomes, not one of the goals, but what are the activities you need to do week in and week out so that you will get the results that you need to get? I need to meet five brand new people. I need to go to two chamber events. I need to reach out to three of my referral sources. The companies that consistently have someone working those activities, when they know they work, they get results on the other end. The folks that say, I'm going to hire someone with a lot of personality, send them out into the wilderness and hope they come back with something, generally you're disappointed, right? And so it's just a really good time to get our sales dialed in, get some training, put that cookbook uh, together. All right, strategy number five is to strengthen the organization. And the word here is align, right? I really believe for a lot of companies, this is the first time, maybe the end of 2023, beginning of 2024, where we're getting out of, of, a, of a reactive mode and we're much more back in control and we can drive the ship in, in, in the way that we want to. Now, that's going to lend itself, I believe, to 2025, 2026, 2027 being great years of opportunity. But I believe the opportunity is going to be what companies make of them. Right? This is the time for the, as a business owner or someone working with businesses to realize, and I have this conversation a lot with folks, like we've got to stop talking about COVID, the economy, the election, the interest. This is the time where you say, I understand there's turbulence. I understand there are challenges. I'm going to take the wheel and we're going to be successful. 
right? And one of the key areas to do this in is organizational alignment. Some people like structures like EOS, which is born out of the book Traction. Other people do it more organically. But some of the biggest challenges, even in companies that have maybe just five or six people in them, is clarifying roles and processes. Who's doing what? Who's responsible? Who do I report to? Who's responsible for developing me and my talents, right? <coughs> do we have a system of accountability? Are the things that are supposed to happen, happen? Sometimes people will say to me, like, I need to really redefine my processes and document it. And we get into the company, we find out, you got plenty of processes. They're all in a book somewhere or on a hard drive somewhere. Like, you've done that work. No one's looking at them, right? No one knows how to use those processes or how we hold the people accountable. Now, the really disappointing thing for business owners is sometimes when they hear accountability, like we'll teach classes on accountability, and they're like, oh, this is great. Get me in that class. I want to know how to get my people to do what they're supposed to do. And we spend the first hour of the class talking about proper ways to place an order and proper ways to set expectations. And they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying I might be part of the problem? And it's like, you might be, right? A lot of what happens in business in terms of delegating, in terms of putting people into roles, giving them tasks to do, we are off track right from the moment we hand something off because we haven't set clear expectations, right? Now, when we do, we should have systems of accountability, but it shouldn't be to catch people doing something wrong. It should be to be able to coach them to success. Right? I always tell people, every business manager, whether you're an owner or a manager, any leadership role, you really play four roles. There's the planning role, there's the reporting role, you know, kind of noting what's going on. There's the critic that says, this is what happened and this is what should have happened. And then there's the coach, right? But when I can say, listen, you know, Kim, my job is not only for you to be successful and for me to react when you're not, but a big part of my job is to help you be successful, right? No one has ever been named coach of the year leading a losing team, right? You can't be an excellent leader, an excellent coach, and have people failing. Now, you can have failures and readjust, but the folks out there that go like, I'm the greatest leader in the world, it's just my people. It's like, you know, what's the old adage? A leader without followers is just a guy out taking a walk, right? It's like, you are not, people are not following you. So what we want to do is make sure that, first of all, you have the right people and culture, but that you create an accountability plan. If something's worth putting out there, how do we know it got done? How do we know what the expectation is? You know, and one of the great examples for me is, you know, if you go out to a restaurant with maybe eight or 10 people, right? And you're going around the table, you kind of get that sense as people are putting their orders in, if the person taking the order is sort of getting it or not really getting it, right? You kind of have that expectation, like it's not a chance we're getting what we ordered, right? Either by the way that the interaction's going or the questions or whatever. When someone's on top of it and says, okay, I'm asking the right questions, and now let me repeat that back to you, and that kind of, you leave with that understanding that, like, there's every likelihood that if the kitchen does what they're supposed to, this is going to go well, right? We don't spend enough time on how we place orders, right? I mean, I'm notorious for ordering stuff on Amazon incorrectly, right? Like, I order the wrong size, right? It's just the options. I don't know what it is, but, like, you know, my wife just says, like, stay out of Amazon because you never get the right thing. And I've even had cases where I've sent it to the wrong place. I have two kids in school, one in Boston, one in Georgia. And if I just sent them something, I'll order something I want. And my son will call from Georgia and go, like, why did you send me this sweatshirt? I don't understand. And it's like, I didn't send it. It was supposed to come to me. Right, yeah, right. And I've even done that with food, right? Right. It's like, what do you mean food showed up in Boston? Like, what are you, what are you talking about? So the key is when we're delegating and we're using that accountability, we've got to place the order correctly. What do we want? When do we want it? The specificity of those things. And then we need someone that knows how to take the order, to ask the right questions, make sure there's clarity. Because that accountability right now and people being aligned is where a lot of profitability is being lost in companies right now. It's not that we don't have the business. It's not that we don't have the system. It's not that we don't have the ability to do it. It's just there's a disconnect between what we should be doing and what we are doing. Now, when you create that culture of accountability in a positive way, you make it easier for your team to be successful, and you actually improve your likelihood of retaining good talent. Because people don't want to be in a system that frustrates them, right? They want to be in a system that makes them more successful. So that kind of leads us to the next strategy, strategy number six, 
uh, which is uh, hire, train, and retain. And to me here, the action word is keep them, right? Talent is hard to find out there. It's hard to develop. It takes time to develop. When we get them, we want to keep them. We want them to be part of our team and we want to invest in training. And so right now when people are looking for folks, and it's funny, I was just having this conversation with someone this morning, they're running an ad and I'm like, well, what do we want? And it's like, I want someone with experience. I want someone that's really good at what they do. I want someone that's going to be able to come in and start contributing right away. And you read the ad and it's written for somebody that's unemployed, sitting at home and doesn't know what they want to do next, right? That is not the person you're trying to hire. Your next hire is working right now. Your next hire is successful in what they're doing. They're making good money, right? The absence of those things, there could be a story why they still would be a good candidate, but the odds aren't in their favor, right? So what says, I think you should come to work for my company? What makes Grow Team Strategies a compelling place to come to work if I'm not paying exorbitant salaries, I don't have the greatest benefit package, some benefits, I don't, like what makes someone want to be part of our team? What makes someone want to be part of your team or your team, right? That's what we need to be thinking about. Maybe it's the career opportunity. Maybe it's the exciting work you're doing. Maybe it's the environment. Whatever it is, it says there's something in the world that they're living in right now, as successful as they are, that they're not finding, that they see when they look at your ad, or they look at your social media, or they look at, you know, your website. I am amazed how many people tell me that hiring is the most important thing and they need talent and they don't even have some sort of join our team on their website. Like, I don't understand that, mm -hmm. right? Or they're not using social media at all. They're using social media very effectively to get the word out about what they do, but not at all about people they're looking for. And frankly, right now, one of the things we see working really well is video, mm -hmm. right? Why? Because if I'm going to go to work for Kim, I want to get an impression as to who she is and what's important to her and I want to feel her enthusiasm. There's no better way than to, to deliver that than with a you know minute, a minute, minute and a half video that talks about what joining our team is compelling. And just like we use testimonials from customers and Google reviews, testimonials from the people working for you that are on that join our team page or they're on social media, right? Because the fact is most of our best hires don't come from general recruiting. They come from somebody that knows somebody. Someone works for us, they bring a friend into the company. This is the kind of place you want to work or a company has a really good reputation. So we really want to make sure we're doing those things. And I always tell people, you don't have to always be hiring, but you should always be recruiting. Right? When I had my accounting practice, there were times when I didn't have like, you know, the need for another account. But I was always willing to go to lunch, to talk to somebody, find out what their story was. Because sometimes, unbeknownst to me, Maybe someone was going to give their notice or we were going to pick up a big account. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, Barry, I didn't think I was in the market for someone quite yet. And I would tell them that when we had lunch, like, listen, this is great. I think we could work together. Let's, let's keep in touch. Let me know if things change on your end. Or, and sometimes it's the other person, right? It's the person saying, I'm not ready to leave my company right now, but at some point I'd like to whatever, whatever, have a shorter commute or work three days a week or whatever it is. But then someone's circumstance changed. And you have that call and it's like, well, this is great. Hey, Barry, I didn't think I'd be calling you this soon, but we actually have an opportunity. We'd love to have you come in and talk about it. I made as many hires that way as I did from the, oh my gosh, now we got an opening. Let me go find somebody, right? And the hard thing is like, we expect the stars to align when we have a problem like that. Someone leaves and now I got to go find someone. And so we're hoping that I can put out a compelling message happen to find someone that just happens to be looking for this kind of work at the same time I need them and they're going to make a change. I mean, to me, that's a very low margin proposition. You know, I tell people not that I had this experience, but to me, it's kind of like not having a date for the prom and just standing outside your house in a tuxedo, hoping someone in a gown breaks down. You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, you can do that. And I'm sure somewhere along the line that's resulted in a prom date, but it's probably not the best way to get a prom date. Right, so we want to always be uh, recruiting. I do have a question. Sure. Let me ask. Let's go. I can take a deep breath. Those folks from Boston never take a deep breath. Right? <laughs> okay, so uh, Mitch commented on the need to reward employees for just doing what their job is. 
they're well compensated in salary, but they are never going to earn millions in stock options. Uh, Fred lists as good people becoming complacent and working to the letter of the law. Absolutely. You know, Mitch, that's an excellent point. And the funny thing about that is sometimes it's not even something that's expensive to do. Sometimes it's a thoughtful gift, right? Sometimes it's a really cool outing you do with your team. You know, you get tickets to something that maybe might be something that not everybody either would do or could do easily um, or just some recognition. But most people, that's a really important piece. So, yeah, I appreciate that comment. You're exactly right. And I like to make sure that for each employee, you have kind of a retention strategy for each one, right? Because what's important to Barry is going to be different than what's important to Al is going to be different to what's important to Kim. You know, for Kim, it might be a little extra money. For Al, it might be an extra day off. For Barry, it might be that he gets to drive the new van, whatever it is, right? But the more we're in tune with what those things are, the easier we can line up. Like, hey, let's do things that are going to be meaningful, you know, you do something for somebody's kid or someone's kid graduates or gets an award or, or is having some challenges. You know, the fact is those things really, really resonate and they tend to build the culture we're all trying to build anyhow, right? That family environment, that cohesive group, the things that we want to do. So, um, yeah, no, Mitch, that was, uh, that's a great point. I need to, I need to add that to the, uh, to the presentation. Well, we have it in the chat for you. There you go. <laughs> Strategy number seven, to minimize complexity. Uh, and, and the, the action word there is just to simplify. This one I feel a little hypocritical because I spent 30 years of my life making things as complicated as I possibly could, right? So I'm trying to spend the next 30 uh, simplifying things, right? Yeah, and so I feel like if the older I get, if every 10 years I declare that I'm having a midlife crisis, then I'm going to live that many more years again, right? I'm just buying years for myself. That said, simplifying is really important. Having well-defined processes with clear expectations. You know, we talk a little bit here about the 80-20 rule, but so much of the effort and, and work that we do is waste. It's, it's, it's not productive work. Now, it's not that we're not working hard, but it's not productive in terms of it being value added to the customer, right? So when, when we say that somebody has, you know, uh, a three-month design process or somebody has, you know, it takes this long to prep for cooking meals or whatever, there's a lot of stuff in there, either the steps that we take or the things that we do, or even sometimes the double checking we do because we don't have enough quality control in the first place, lend themselves to, to systems that take longer than they should, that take more resource. Now, there's only two things that we can do with that. If we have more costs, more time tied up in the things that we're doing because they're not simple and straightforward, we have way too many apps. We don't know how to find stuff on the hard drive. You know, is it under marketing chamber or chamber marketing, right? You can spend like an hour a day looking for stuff, right? The reality is though, when we spend that time, there's only two people or two entities that can pay for that time. Either the company pays for it and we make less money or we build it into our price and the customer's paying more than they should. The reality is every time we suck waste out of a process, our price gets more competitive and our profit margin has the potential to improve. What we really want is nobody paying for that waste as opposed to choosing, do we pay for it or do they pay for it? Does that make sense? And so one of the things that we really love as a concept is a concept called lean. Uh, it's born out of, you may have heard it as the Toyota production system. It started with Toyota in the 1950s. Um, and it was really about identifying a process. And we all have hundreds of processes that we go through, sales processes, ordering processes, hiring processes. But when you look at a process from start to finish, and you look at each step as to whether or not it adds value to the customer or it doesn't and how much time we're spending on it and what would it take to streamline that. It's not about getting people to work harder. It's not about getting people to work faster. It's not even about getting people to cut corners. It's about taking things that don't make any extra benefit. If I don't have my truck organized and I have to go back to the warehouse because I didn't know I left without a tool that I needed, who's paying for that ride there? and the ride back, either the company or the customer, right? Or if I have all my tools mapped out on shelves and labeled and the, where things are supposed to be and I can open the back of my truck every morning and know nothing's missing, right? That's a much better system and nobody pays for that ride back. So there's lots of different ways to do it, but it is worth looking into. The other thing we like about the lean process is you don't have to look at every process and you don't have to look at it from top down. 
you can take the slice of a process, how we take our first intake call, how we deliver a package, or how do we make sure when a package is delivered, we got what we were supposed to and it's not broken, right? You can take that smaller process and say, okay, what is our process? Who's involved? Where are we running into problems? What's a better way to do it? And if I can squeeze 20 minutes out of that process or some dollars out of that process, it just got better and I have more time to put to other things. So it doesn't have to be beginning to end. Sometimes I'll have people say to me, Doug, I'm going to map all my processes from when a first person first calls until I'm done with the project and document everyone and then I'm going to work on improvement. I'm like, great. Give me a call in about seven years because this is going to take you about that long to do that, right? Or you can do what I like to do is think about it like a traffic map, right? If we were looking at a traffic map of Baltimore right now in your GPS, you'd see some roads that are red, some that are yellow, some that are green, right? If we're going to start solving problems, we want to find the red roads first and say, okay, what would, it, what would it take to fix that? Do we need better signage, a different lane, you know, what, whatever it is. The funny thing about that is when we go after the things that are causing us the most difficulty, we also then tend to free up other problems as well. Right? You fix a traffic jam on a road that's red, it tends to also fix the you know, five miles before that that's yellow. Right? So when we look at what's holding us up, getting the right information from our customer, right? I know in accounting, like you can only do what you can do with what they give you. Right? And so one of the things that we struggled with very early on was how do we take people for whom accounting is not their thing and just make sure that we're giving them the right instruction, checklist, checking the package when they give it to us, validating before we even start doing their accounting, do we have everything? Because what we found uh, was that if we started working on an account, it didn't add like 10% more time if we didn't have what we needed and had to stop and wait for it and go back. It added like double the time, right? By the time we stopped what we were doing, packaged it up, came back to it, you know, and had those discussions. So really looking at that lean as an opportunity, I think is, is super important. Strategy number eight is to tighten pricing and overhead. This is a really good time to go back and look at the things, I'm doing this in my company as well, that we're spending money on. Some of it's big stuff, you know, maybe we've added a position or we've taken some additional office space. Some of it might be very small stuff, like we've got seven apps and we don't even know what they are, but they're, all, they're all 20 bucks a piece each. But when you start to add that up by so many months and so many years, it's like, but if we're not using it, right? Should we even have it? So I always like to say to folks, one of the things we do, and there's lots of different ways to do it, but this is generally an easy one for folks. I like to do what I call the 90% challenge. We'll put on an Excel sheet everything they're spending money on, right, in the course of a month or on their profit loss statement. In the next column, we'll put 90% of that number, right? Makes it easy because 10% is pretty easy to figure out, right? And the fact is we just have a conversation that says, if you cut this 10%, first of all, could you? You might be under contract and you can't. Or it might be something you'd never want to cut, right? Like owner's compensation, we don't encourage cutting that, right? And then is it going to affect me? We look at internal and external. Is it going to affect my ability to deliver to the customer, right? And a lot of times what we find is we're spending money on stuff. It doesn't impact the customer. And it would take very little you know, we've been meaning to renegotiate that dumpster contract, or, you know, we're still paying for seven cell phones, even though we have five salespeople. So, you know, and you start to look at it. I will tell you that when the people do this, it's nothing exciting. It's nothing sexy. It's not big dollars. Right? People are always looking for big dollars. It's like, man, if you're missing the big dollars, we got bigger problems. You're looking at that stuff, right? But I'll take $200 in savings, spread over 12 months, spread over five years. It's like, that's money right? And it's money we're working hard to make. And right now, whether it's you can put a better price out on the street, or you can improve your cash flow and give yourself a little bit of strength and staying power, right? Or you just make a little bit more money. This is a really good time to get costs down that you don't need. Now, if it's something that's contributing to what you do, how you do it, like to me, one of the frustrations is that when people get tight on money, what do you think are some of the first things they cut on in their budget? What do they stop spending money on? You got to know one of them, Andrew. Um, their marketing budget. Their marketing budget. Yeah, right. They, 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 <laughs> they cut back on marketing, staffing, and training, right? Because those are the things I can do today, right, that will make a big difference and maybe will not show up as a problem today. The problem is if my business is here and I want it to be here, Drag them in view. 
right? <laughs> if, if we're here and we want it to be here, the things that are going to get me here are better staff, better training, and better marketing. So the reality is sometimes we get here, we're shooting for here, but we cut some things, and so our next move is here. So then what do we do? We've got some more things, right? And then it gets harder and harder to get back to where we need it to be. So we just want to be conscious about, let's cut everything we don't need and not cut the things that are going to help us get to, to where we need to be. All right, strategy number nine. Is that nine? Yeah, okay, strategy number nine, um, cash flow. Cash flow is a big deal. You can be a very profitable company and run out of cash, and it won't matter that you were a very profitable company. Cash is the fuel in the engine that says this thing gets to keep running, right? We can be making good time. We can have the right GPS. We can be on track. We can be ahead of schedule. The car's running well. And if we run out of fuel, we will be on the side of the road, right? And so right now, with bigger numbers out there, the cost of things going up, if you have projects, you know, someone paying you a little more slowly because they're feeling the pressure, but also the, the dollar, the ticket amount of what they are paying you is bigger, all of a sudden is creating cash flow challenges for companies that never had them, right? So how do we manage like when we're overbilling? In other words, when we're billing things even before we've earned the money, right? Someone gives us a big deposit on a job or they're paying for something as we go or they give us a retainer and it's like, whoop, we've used that cash, but we haven't done the work yet. Right? or at least not all of the work yet. You know? So we want to look for strategies for retaining cash, to be very careful about that. Because the other thing is, it's not an easy time to go to the bank. You know, Years ago, I remember, cash got tight. You could call up and get your line of credit extended over the phone. Right? They didn't even ask for anything. You know? Now, th there were some bad things about that, too. Right. So I'm not advocating that as an economic policy. <laughs> However, um, the fact was, I mean, I remember the time saying, like, listen, it's kind of a slow time right now. We got some stuff going on. Can you bump our line from like 50 to 75,000? They did it that day, like over the phone, right? And now it's like, as soon as you tell the bank that you might have a challenge, they're worried about the money they've already given you, right? And the problem is they're seeing some of the doom and gloom signs. So the thing is, you know, when companies are strong, we're encouraging, like talk to your banker now, get a line of credit now. Now there are some clients that I don't trust with a line of credit, right? They like, it's like gambling to them. So when people call and say, do you think I qualify for a line of credit? If I know their personality, I'm like, not a chance. Let's not even talk about it. Let's just forget about it, right? But the reality is those are some things you can do. How you collect from customers, what size deposit you take. You know, I've got someone right now down in Virginia, really, really great business owner. He does projects on time and material, so he bills after the work's done. And he's let $300,000 worth of work sit out there, and some of it's 18 months old. You know, it's like to call somebody 18 months later and say, hey, Jules, I think you owe me $37,000, right, for a project that I did 18 months ago, right? Now, Jules may say, you know what, I knew that also, and I've been holding that money for you, right? Jules may also say, you know what, now that I've seen this project 18 months later, I'm not even that excited about what you did, or did I really owe you that much, or, and all of a sudden, that 37000 is in jeopardy, right? Or you never hear from them again. But either way, there's no good reason to let that money sit out there while you try to get a business to function. We like folks to be able to project cash flow out at least 12 weeks, week by week. I think that's super important. Now, there are some businesses where cash flow is hard to predict. There's some businesses where cash flow is easier to make up. But if it takes you a month to get a new client or it takes you two months to get a project going, You've got to be able to look out over that period of time and say, I'm not going to be able to infuse cash into this, even if I sign somebody up today, other than robbing from another project. So I want to know my cash flow is good two, three months out. Because the other thing is, if I know I'm going to have a cash flow issue in July, I still have lots of things I can do about it. If I find out today I can't make payroll next week, now I'm making dumb decisions, right? I'm panicking. So you just don't want to be in that situation. All right, the last one is to create a growth plan, growth planning. And so the action is to look ahead, right? Um, this is a, a template that we use. Be happy to share it with folks. But the idea is I believe it's important to project five years of financials, a five-year org chart. You may have to make some guesses along the way. Sometimes people will project five years of financials. And the one great thing about Excel is it can make everybody a billionaire in five years if you use the right formula. Right? That doesn't mean you have money to go to the grocery store with. It just means Excel says you're going to be a billionaire. A lot of times what they, they forget are the expenses that are going to increase along with that. 
the staff that you're going to need to deliver that. So when we start marrying those two up, we start to get a more realistic look at things. When we get to lay that out, we like to add that question that's on that third line, which should have a question mark on it. What needs to be true? But it's essentially asking what needs to be true of the business in five years that's not true today. We need a sales process. I need a second salesperson. We need a bigger office. Because it's those things that we got to make sure find their way into the plan. Because there's never going to be a day when you say, oh my gosh, you know what? I've got so much time and so much money. I'm going to stop and add a, new, add, a, add a new office location. Or I'm going to add a new position. These are things we have to grow into. Part of the reason this is a challenge, especially for small businesses, is because when you do this, you're going to take money off the bottom line to do some of these things. Right? When a manufacturing company grows or a retail location grows, expands, they go out and they get either borrow or investment dollars or whatever, and it goes on their balance sheet, right? But it doesn't affect their profitability very much in the current year. So if I put a million dollars into a new building, I don't lose a million dollars that year, right? However, if I put $200,000 into additional staff this year, that $200,000 does come out of my profit this year. So what do you think happens in year two or three of this five-year plan when it's like, I know I'm supposed to add that operations manager. I know it's going to be a $100,000 salary. I'm starting to think, man, you know, the election, the interest rates, maybe this isn't the time to do it. So I hold off. But maybe it was the very next thing I needed to do, right? But guess what? It's not going to look any easier the next year. So it's only when we step back and look at a five-year model that we say, okay, I understand we're going to impact this here, but it's the only way that those numbers jump up in years three, four, and five. So I always tell people to think about it like a five-day road trip, right? If we were going to drive from here to California, and let's say I had to be at my, my daughter was getting married at two o'clock on Saturday in Los Angeles. I have lots and lots of daughters, so someone's always getting married, right? So some, that wedding's going to happen whether I get there or not. So I set my plan and I'm going to drive for whatever reason. And I got to be at such and such a place after day one and day two and day three. If I don't get as far as I felt like I needed to on day one, what do I do on day two? Drive a little faster, drive a little faster with no, the sorry. confines of the law, right? Or I leave a little earlier or I skip a step or I take a different route, but I adjust, right? If by day three in the trip, I am nowhere near halfway there, what do I do? Get on a plane. In other words, it's not about adjusting. It's about I need a new strategy. When you clearly lay out where you want to be in five years, right? Yeah, right. When you clearly know where you want to be in five years, you can adjust, right, if things are behind and that's okay. But then there may be a point where we say, nope, we need a different strategy. But if we look at just things year by year, right, and, and Barry, you may have this uh, in, the, in the work that you do too, right? I used to be thrilled if a customer would even do a budget for the current year, right? So and then when I say, now when they say I do a budget each year, and I'm like, yeah, that's not good enough either, right? It seems, it seems rude. But, but the fact is, when you look at that five-year plan, this is where we see people being able to break through that difficult point and actually grow their business. Because what we want to be focused on is the timing of the outcome and the destination of the outcome those should be the driver, right? They shouldn't be the variable, right? It's not, I'm just going to drive for as long as I can. And if I get close, I get close. No, that doesn't get me there. If I'm not at that wedding at two o'clock on Saturday, it's going on without me. If I want to have this amount of dollars in my bank account, or I want my balance sheet to look like this, or I want to be out of debt, or whatever it happens to be, the destination and the timing of that is the fixed thing. The question, the variable needs, what do I need to do to make it work? Right. So my version of driving faster or leaving early is maybe pricing changes, maybe more marketing, maybe whatever. But it all says like what I'm not doing is saying I'll take whatever's left or I'll get there when I get there. Right. And that's what a lot of business owners end up doing. All right. So to wrap up successful imp implementation, I think you create your five year plan. You develop a leadership team. It can be one or two people or it can be more than that. But it's people you want to be able to share ideas and bounce stuff off. Setting quarterly priorities for the company is super important. Not trying to do everything at once. If you said, Doug, I think three of these strategies would really be helpful. I'd like to implement them. I'd say like take one, make it the focus for the next quarter, get it there, get it, you know, get some momentum. Maybe then we add something else and then make sure you establish me methods, whether it's a, a coach or a mentor or a partner or a, uh, you know, advisory group or whatever it is 
that will hold you accountable. It's too easy to get away from doing the things we know we should do, right? Just because we got fires to put out today. Um, so uh, if you want the slides or you know any kind of a conversation, you can get me at doug.howard at growthteams.com. Also, for anybody that's uh, been here, I'd be happy to send out not only our five-year planning tool, but our 10 strategies checklist. Um, you know, we, we love to share this information. Each one of these strategies is stuff that we work with the clients on all the time. So even if it's just a question from, you know, hey, I'm thinking about such and such, you know, we love to participate in having those conversations. Um, and other than that, we just really appreciate your time. I know everybody's busy. Uh, happy to answer some questions. And we certainly appreciate, Kim, what you guys at the chamber do. You raise the, the, the tide for all of us, and we appreciate that. But creating opportunities to do this kind of stuff is super helpful. So hope some of it was helpful. Do you have any 